about two problems on condensers, then I will introduce uh, refrigerant evaporators. So, the specific objectives of this particular lecture are to present worked out examples for thermal design of water cooled and air cooled condensers, introduce evaporators, present classification of evaporators, describe salient features of some of the important types of evaporators. And at the end of the lesson, you should be able to carry out thermal design of air cooled and water cooled condensers using suitable correlations and formula, classify refrigerant evaporators based on various criteria, describe important features of some of the important types of evaporators. So, let me begin with a worked out example. This is an example on shell and tube condenser and the problem uh, statement is like this. You have to find the length of tubes in a 2 pass 10 ton uh, capacity shell and tube R22 based water cooled condenser with 52 tubes arranged in 13 columns. The heat rejection ratio is given as 1.2747, the condensing temperature is 45 degree centigrade, water inlet and outlet temperatures are 30 degree centigrade and 35 degree centigrade respectively. The tube outer and inner diameters are 14 and 16 mm respectively. So, uh, the problem uh, sure must be clear to you. It is an R22 based uh, condenser, water cooled condenser. It has 52 tubes and 13 columns. 52 tubes are arranged in 13 columns. And the other data is given as per the uh, problem. So, now let us look at uh, how to solve the problem. So, this is the schematic. In fact, I have last class I have shown this uh, schematic of a two pass uh, shell and tube type of a condenser. And as I have explained to you, uh, here uh, refrigerant is there on the shell side. Okay. You can see that refrigerant is entering at the top and it condenses as it comes in contact with the tubes and the liquid refrigerant goes out from the bottom. And water enters from the bottom like this, coolant is nothing but the water and it flows through these tubes. Since it is a two pass, the same water again will flow through the um, uh, condenser tubes. Okay. So, it comes here and again it goes back to the uh, condenser tube. That is why you call it as a two pass uh, condenser. That means, the water makes two passes uh, as it flows through the condenser. And uh, in the problem, it is mentioned that there are uh, 52 tubes okay, and they are arranged in 13 columns. Now, uh, for the first thing we have to do is we have to uh, find out the properties of uh, R22 and water because we have to evaluate the heat transfer coefficients and all. So, these are the properties at uh, average uh, temperature. Uh, for water, uh, viscosity is given as 7.73 into 10 to the power of minus 4 kg per meter second. Thermal conductivity is given as 0.617 watt per meter Kelvin and density is 995 kg per meter cube. Specific heat of water is given as 4.19 kilo joule per kg K and Prandtl number is given as 5.25, PR is Prandtl number. And for R22, the average properties are viscosity is 1.8 into 10 to the power of minus 4 kg per meter second. Thermal conductivity Kf is 0 0.0779 watt per meter Kelvin and density is 1118.9 kg per meter cube and latent heat of uh, uh, vaporization is 160.9 kilo joule per kg. This is at the condensing uh, temperature. And it is also given in the problem that the fouling resistance on water side and thermal conductivity of copper are uh, fouling resistance is 0 0.000176 meter square Kelvin per watt and the thermal conductivity of water is given as 390 watt per meter Kelvin. So, this is how the problem is uh, stated. So, now we have to uh, find out the required length of each tube. Okay. So, first uh, uh, the step is to find out what is the required heat transfer rate in condenser. You know that required heat transfer rate in condenser is nothing but Q c is equal to product of heat rejection ratio H r r into refrigeration capacity and the heat rejection rate and ra ratio is given as 1.2747 and the refrigeration capacity is given as 10 tons. So, we convert that into kilowatts. So, this is 10 into 3.5167 kilowatt. So, from this equation you find that the condenser heat transfer rate is 44.83 kilowatt. Then we let us find the required mass flow rate of water. So, from energy balance we can also write Q c is equal to M w C p w into T w o minus T w i, whereas you know M w is the mass flow rate of water, C p w is the specific heat of water. TWO and TWI are exit and inlet temperatures of water. And we know here we know the values of QC, we also know the value of CP, we also know the temperatures. So, if you substitute those values, you find that the total mass flow rate of water is 2.14 kg per second. Now, this 2.14 kg per second is distributed 
in uh, many, many tubes. Okay. Since it is a two pass condenser with 52 tubes, water flow through each tube is given by this formula. This is m subscript w i is the water flow through each tube that is equal to m w by 26. Why do we get 26? There are 52 tubes, but it is a two pass, two pass condenser. That means in uh, one uh, in one pass, the water flows through 26 tubes. So the total flow rate is given by 2.14 kg per second. So uh, through individual tube, the flow rate is uh, 2.14 divided by 26. So that is 0 0.0823 kg per second. Now, once we know the water flow rate and once we know the water properties, we can calculate the Reynolds number for water side. So, as you know, Reynolds number for water side is rho V d by mu. This can also be written in terms of the mass flow rates. So, in terms of mass flow rate, it is 4 into m w i divided by pi d i mu w, where m w i as you have seen is the mass flow rate through each tube and d i is the internal diameter of the tube and mu w is the viscosity of water. So, if you substitute these values because everything is known to you, if you substitute these values, you find that the Reynolds number for water side is 46882.6. Since uh, this is greater than 2300, we can this is turbulent flow. So, we have to use the turbulent flow correlations for finding the heat transfer. So, let us find the heat transfer coefficient on water side. In fact, in last class, I have mentioned that if it is turbulent flow, we can use uh, dittus bolter equation or cedar tate equation. So, in this problem, let us use dittus bolter equation. dittus bolter equation, as you know, is uh, nothing but Nusselt number is equal to 0 0.023, Reynolds number to the power of 0.8, Prandtl number to the power of 0.4. So, we know Reynolds number, we also know the Prandtl number. So, if you substitute these values, you find that the Reynolds uh, Nusselt number for water side is 68.96. So, once you know the Nusselt number, you can find out the heat transfer coefficient because heat transfer coefficient is nothing but Nusselt number into thermal conductivity of water divided by the diameter. So, if you substitute these values, you find that uh, heat transfer coefficient on water side is 3039 watt per meter square Kelvin. Now, let us find the um, uh, heat transfer coefficient on the condensation side. So, condensation heat transfer coefficient. Since uh, condensation is uh, this is a shell and tube type of uh, condenser. So, obviously, water is flowing through the tube. So, condensation is taking place outside the tubes. And uh, this is, uh, since nothing is mentioned, we let us take this as a horizontal uh, shell and tube type of condenser. So, let us use the correlation for horizontal uh, condensation and horizontal tubes. So, in, in fact, in the last class, I have mentioned that uh, we can use the classical uh, uh, correlation given by Nusselt. In fact, Nusselt's correlation is uh, valid for laminar flow. Uh, so, here uh, this is valid. In fact, you can cross check that uh, you will find that it is valid here. So, let us apply the Nusselt's uh, correlation for finding the condensation heat transfer coefficient. So, what is Nusselt's uh, correlation? So, this is the Nusselt's correlation for laminar film condensation outside horizontal tube. I have explained this in the last uh, lecture. Okay, here, uh, as you know, uh, this is the thermal conductivity of uh, saturated uh, refrigerant. This is the density of saturated refrigerant at condenser temperature, and this is acceleration due to gravity. This is the latent heat of vaporization at that uh, temperature and pressure. N is the total number of tubes in a row, and uh, d naught is the outer diameter of the tube on which condensation is taking place. Mu f is the viscosity of the saturated liquid, and delta t is nothing but the temperature difference between the refrigerant and the wall okay surface let us say okay so this is the nusselt's correlation and uh, here h naught is in uh, watt per meter square kelvin and all other units are in si so you have to use the si units this you have to be careful while using the units so we know from the problem we know everything except delta t so let us find uh, h naught Okay, so, if you substitute uh, number of tubes per row, we have to find out that is capital N. Since it is mentioned that there are total number of, uh, there are 52 tubes uh, and they are distributed in 13 rows. So, number of tubes per row is nothing but 52 by 13, that is 4. So, if you substitute this 4 and the other property values, you will find that the Nusselt correlation, from the Nusselt correlation, H naught is given as 2175 divided by delta T to the power of 0 0.25. Okay. So, here delta T as I have already mentioned is nothing but the temperature difference between the condensing refrigerant and the surface. This is not known to us. So, what we have to do is we have to use the trial and error method. Okay. 
trial and error method means initially we uh, use a guess value of delta t find out uh, h naught find out u naught and all and uh, finally you have to cross check uh, whether the guess value is correct value or not i will show you that uh, procedure now before that for water cooled condensers without fins the overall heat transfer coefficient is given by this formula this also i have explained in the last class as you know this is the convective resistance uh, of the inside this is the fouling resistance on water side and this is the resistance offered by the wall and this is the external uh, resistance okay now everything is known to us because a not and i ai and all can be expressed in terms of diameters so diameters are given to us properties are also given and uh, this fouling uh, resistance is also mentioned in the problem statement so we know everything okay so uh, we, if you substitute everything you find that the overall heat transfer coefficient is uh, like this 1 by u naught is equal to 0 0.0005781 plus 1 by h naught h naught is not fully known to us because we do not know what is the delta t okay so as i said we have to go for a trial and error method so first let us uh, take a guess for initial guess value of 5 degree centigrade so once you uh, take a guess value of 5 degree centigrade condensation heat transfer coefficient h naught is equal to 2175 divided by delta t to the power of 0.25 so delta t is 5 degrees so from this we find that heat transfer coefficient is 1454.5 watt per meter square kelvin on the refrigerant side once you know this you can substitute this in the expression for overall heat transfer coefficient and you find that 1 by u naught is equal to 0.0012656 meter square kelvin per watt that means the overall heat transfer coefficient u naught is equal to 790.2 watt per meter square kelvin so we have found the u naught and we know that uh, for the condenser we can write this equation qc is equal to u naught a naught into lmtd which is equal to 44.83 kilowatt qc is 44.83 kilowatt now for, uh, in, uh, so we have to uh, to in order to find out a naught we have to find lmtd because u naught is known to us so lmtd as you know is uh, for a condensation uh, process lmtd we, uh, can be written like this t no, two minus twi divided by natural log of tc minus twi divided by tc minus two where as you know tc is the temperature of the refrigerant twi and two are the inlet and outlet temperatures of water okay so all these things are known to us so if you substitute these values you find that the lmtd is 12.33 kelvin okay so if you substitute the values of lmtd and u not in the expression for qc then you find that uh, the area uh, um, uh, required area that is outer area is 4.6 meter square now as i have already mentioned uh, you should not stop the this thing here because uh, this uh, value we got by taking an initial gas value of uh, 5 degree kelvin per for uh, delta t okay so now we have to see whether the delta t is really 5 degree kelvin or not if it is not 5 kelvin we have to go for the next uh, trial okay so for, for let us calculate what is the delta t now delta t can also be written uh, in this manner delta t is equal to qc divided by h not into a not uh, because you can write uh, qc in terms of qc can be written in terms of uh, outer convective heat transfer coefficient outer area into uh, refrigerant temperature minus surface temperature okay this is nothing but delta t right so h not is nothing but condensation uh, heat transfer coefficient which is known to us a not just we have computed okay so if you substitute everything you can find out what is the uh, calculated value of delta t that's what we are doing now okay so if you substitute the values for qc h not and a not you find that Uh, delta t calculated is 6.7 kelvin so you find that the gas value is uh, we have started the um, uh, solution by taking an initial gas value of 5 degree kelvin but when at the end when you calculate delta t you find that it is 6.7 kelvin since there is a difference of 2 degree 2 degrees between the gas value and the calculated value we have to go for a next trial okay so in the next trial what we do is let us assume a delta t of 7 kelvin okay and repeat the pro repeat the calculations so what we do is as i said since the calculated value is not equal to the assumed value we have to repeat the calculation with delta t is equal to 7 kelvin so this is a second trial so once you assume delta t uh, t is 7 kelvin again you have to find out h not because h not is expressed in terms of delta t so once you find the h not 
uh, you find the overall heat transfer coefficient. Once you find the overall heat transfer coefficient, you find out area and for, from the area again you have find out what is the delta T calculated there and you compare delta T calculated with again the guess value. Okay. So, this process has to be repeated till you ge get the converged values. right? So, from the if you repeat the calculation with uh, 7 Kelvin uh, guess value, you find that the delta T calculated will be 6.96 Kelvin now. Okay. So, this is almost uh, equal to 7 Kelvin. So, you can stop here, but if you want more accuracy, of course, you can uh, again repeat the uh, calculation by taking a uh, third uh, trial value, right. But uh, since this uh, difference is very less, we need not go for third trial, okay. So, since this value as I said sufficiently close to second guess value of 7 k, we may stop here, okay. So, for 7 k uh, temperature difference, we obtain the value of u naught uh, to be 754 watt per meter square Kelvin. So, once you know the value of u naught and LMTT and Q c, we find the value of A naught equal to 4.82 meter square. Okay. Ultimately, we have to find the length of the tube. Okay. So, A naught is nothing but uh, there are 56 tubes. Okay. So, my total area is uh, 56 into pi d uh, o into L, okay, where pi d, d o is the outer diameter of the tube. Right. There are 56 tubes, so we use 56. L is the length of the this thing which is unknown to us, but d naught is the outer diameter which is known to us 16 mm. Okay. So, if you substitute those values, you find that the required length is 1.713 meter. Okay. So, this is a uh, how you have to uh, do the uh, uh, design of a shell and tube uh, condenser. Of course, this is not a complete design, this is only a thermal design of shell and tube uh, condensers. Okay. So, you have to proceed in a systematic manner first by getting the required properties right, and then using the you know, correct formula and then calculate the various quantities and then uh, you have to go as I said you have to go for uh, trial and error method. Okay. And when you are using a trial and error method, you have to take uh, use intelligent guess values. Okay. You should not use uh, unrealistic guess values, then uh, it may take a long time. You have to do the uh, calculation for many trials, you have to take many trials. Okay. So, use the value judiciously, then it will converge within 2, 3 steps. Right. Now, let me uh, explain the design of an air cool condenser. Again, let me read the problem. Uh, you have to determine the required face area of an R12 condenser for 5 ton refrigeration plant. The condensing temperature is 40 degree centigrade, the system COP is 4.9 and refrigeration effect is 110.8 kilojoule per kg. Air at an inlet temperature of 27 degrees centigrade flows to the condenser with a phase velocity of 2.5 meter per second. The inside and outside diameters of the tubes are 11.26 and 12.68 millimeter respectively. Fin efficiency is given as 0.73 and the other dimensions, these are the spacings and thickness of uh, fins. Okay. A facing, um, a spacing between uh, 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 two tubes in a row B is given by 43 mm and uh, C is 38 mm, D is 3.175 mm and the thickness of the fin is 0.254 mm. Okay. So, what is given here? Capacity is given and condensing temperature is given, COP is given and refrigeration effect is given. Okay. And then air inlet temperature is given, outlet temperature is not given. And phase velocity of air is given as 2.5 meter per second and the inner and outer diameter of the tubes are given and other uh, uh, heat exchanger uh, dimensions are given. Okay. So, as you know this we have discussed in the last class, I have shown you typical, uh, I said this is the typical fin and tube type of uh, condenser. And as I said, this is the face area. Okay, this is the face area. We have to find out what is the face area, right? And we have also defined uh, a certain parameters. For example, as I was telling you just now, uh, B is nothing but the center to center distance between two uh, consecutive tubes in a row, right? This value is given. C is this is the side view. Okay, C is the center to center distance between two rows, right? Uh, so that is C. And uh, D is the center to center distance between two consecutive fins, and uh, T, as I said, is the thickness of the fin, right? So the, all these uh, parameters are uh, given to us. So we have to ultimately find out the phase area, and uh, we also uh, know the phase velocity. Okay, phase velocity is mentioned as 2.5 meter per second. Now, first thing we do here is let us find out various heat transfer areas. All these areas have been defined in the last lecture. So, you can refer to the last lecture for these formulae. Okay. So, I am just giving the formula here. Uh, first is the bare tube area A B, 
a b is given by d minus t by b d into pi d naught and the d is nothing but fin to fin spacing. So, that is 3.175 millimeter uh, minus 0 0.254 is the thickness of the fin and b is the spacing the center to center spacing between uh, two tubes in a row that is given as 43 mm and uh, so if you substitute these values uh, d naught is the outer diameter of the tube. So, if you substitute all these values you get this value for a b and remember that this is defined as meter square per row uh, per meter square face area this is very important okay the unit. So, everything all the areas we are expressing as meter square per row per meter square face area okay. Then uh, let us calculate the fin area a f, fin area a f this is the formula again everything is known to us d is known c is known d naught is known b is known. So, if we substitute everything you get the fin area to be 22.087 meter square per row per meter square face area okay. Now, let us find out what is the minimum flow area, minimum flow area is as I said uh, is nothing but the area between the two tubes okay the where uh, the uh, velocity becomes maximum and the flow area becomes minimum okay. So, that is defined as this d minus t by d into 1 minus d naught by b and again everything is known. So, if you substitute that you find that minimum flow area is 0 0.6487 meter square per row per meter square face area. Then total area a naught is nothing but uh, a b plus a f that is bare tube area plus fin tube area. So, that is uh, found to be 22.94 meter square per row per meter square face area okay and the internal area, internal area is a i and the formula a i for a i is pi d i by b and this works out to be 0 0.82266 meter square per row per meter square face area okay. Then we have to find out the hydraulic diameter because we want to find out the Nusselt number and Reynolds numbers. Hydraulic diameter is defined if you remember as the uh, 4 into minimum flow area divided by the wetted perimeter okay and the formula for that is given uh, like this. Okay, so, this is the formula for uh, minimum flow area I mean uh, hydraulic diameter dh and c is known to us a c is the minimum flow area and a naught is the uh, a naught is also known where this is the total area okay that is 22.94. So, if you substitute everything here okay this uh, should be 22.94 I have rounded off it okay it, it is actually 22.9393 but I rounded it off to 22.94. So, you find that the hydraulic uh, diameter is given as 4.2984 into 10 to the power of minus 3 meters and we also need these uh, area ratios for calculating the overall heat transfer coefficient okay. So, this area ratio a naught by a i is the total area divided by internal area uh, that uh, works out to be 27.8843 and a b by a f that is the bare tube area divided by fin area is 0 0.3715. So, now we have found all the required uh, areas. Now, let us find out the condenser heat rejection rate. So, in the last problem for water cooled condenser, uh, the heat rejection ratio is given directly, okay. But in this problem, it is not given directly, but uh, the COP value is uh, specified. And we know that heat rejection ratio is nothing but 1 plus 1 by COP, okay. So, we have to find the heat rejection ratio first. And from the heat rejection ratio, we can find out the uh, heat transfer rate at the condenser, okay. So, that is what I have done here the condenser heat rejection rate q c is equal to h r r into q e where q e is the refrigeration capacity that is 5 tons and h r r is 1 plus 1 by c o p and c o p is given as 4.9 and q e we know 5 ton convert that into kilowatts by multiplying into the 3.5167. So, if you multiply that and substitute the values you find that the required heat rejection rate at condenser that is q c is equal to 21.17 kilowatts. Now, we have to find out what is the mass flow rate of refrigerant. To find out the mass flow rate of refrigerant, we know the refrigeration capacity and also the refrigeration effect is specified, okay. So, we know that uh, if you do an energy balance for the evaporator neglecting uh, the kinetic and potential energy changes, we know that the refrigeration capacity uh, is nothing but uh, mass flow rate of refrigerant into refrigeration effect, okay. So, refrigeration effect is specified. So, substitute the value of refrigeration effect and the refrigeration capacity, you find that the mass flow rate of refrigerant is equal to 0.15869 kg per second okay. So, from now, now first let us find out the condensation heat transfer coefficient. For that we need the properties of R12. So, the properties of R12 uh, I have not mentioned here, but uh, the properties have to be evaluated at uh, condensing temperature and condensing temperature is uh, specified as 40 degree centigrade. So, you have to find out the saturated uh, properties of R12 uh, liquid and vapor at 
40 degree centigrade. Okay, so I have used those values, and using those values, I have found these non-dimensional numbers. Okay, first I have found the Prandtl number of a refrigerant that is Cp uh, Cp mu by k, and uh, this is the Prandtl number for the saturated liquid. Okay, F stands for liquid. Okay, so so I have you have to use all the liquid values, right? So if you use these values, you find that Prandtl number for the liquid refrigerant is 3.264. And the Reynolds number for the gas, okay, G is for the vapor or the gas, okay. That is again uh, can be written in terms of the mass flow rates, 4 into m dot divided by pi di mu z. And this Reynolds number is calculated when all the mass is in vapor form, okay. So you have to use the total mass flow rate here, right. So this Reynolds number is the Reynolds number when all the refrigerant is in vapor form. Similarly, Reynolds number of the fluid is calculated assuming that all the refrigerant is in liquid form okay that is ref so if you substitute the values you find that this is the reynolds number of the refrigerant vapor similarly reynolds number of the refrigerant liquid is this okay so we got the reynolds numbers and prandtl number then to find the condensate heat transfer coefficient inside tubes we use dean ackers and crossers correlation which assumes complete condensation in fact this is a new correlation in the last uh, lecture I have shown two other correlations, Chato and Chadox correlation and other correlation, okay. Uh, but uh, here I am using a different correlation, okay. The, this is because I want to present as many cor correlations as possible, right. So let us uh, calculate the condensed heat transfer coefficient using uh, the, uh, this D Necker's uh, correlation. And this correlation is valid uh, for under the assumption that the condensation is complete, okay. So this correlation defines a modified Reynolds number REM. And this modified Reynolds number is defined like this. Okay, this correlation, if you notice, uh, uh, correlates Nusselt number in terms of Reynolds number and Prandtl number. So this is the basic uh, uh, correlation, Dean Eckers and Crossers correlation. So you can see that this looks like a Dieter's Volter equation. Okay, you have a constant here, R e to the power of 0 0.8 and P r to the power of 1 by 3. Okay, only difference is the Reynolds number that I am using here is a modified Reynolds number. Okay, it is neither Reynolds number of the vapor nor the Reynolds number of gas. It is a modified Reynolds number and modified Reynolds number formula is like this. It is written in terms of the Reynolds number of the refrigerant liquid and the density of the uh, saturated liquid and density of the saturated vapor rho f and rho z. So densities can be written in terms of specific volumes. And we know the specific volumes from uh, the property data that is at 40 degree centigrade and REF also we have found. So you can find out what is the uh, modified Reynolds number and Prandtl number is also known to us. So if we substitute all these values, we can find out what is the Nusselt number. So substituting various property values and Reynolds number, we find that our Reynolds number, modified Reynolds number is uh, 431, 383. And Nusselt number is uh, 1265.9 and condensation heat transfer coefficient HI is uh, 8206.7 watt per meter square Kelvin. Okay, so that is how we have found the <coughs> condensation heat transfer coefficient. Now let us find the air side heat transfer coefficient because for calculating the overall heat transfer coefficient you require uh, uh, heat transfer coefficient on the refrigerant side, heat transfer coefficient on the uh, air side. Okay, so let us find out the heat transfer coefficient on the air side. Remember that this is a fin, uh, plate fin type of a, a condenser, so you have to use uh, suitable correlations for plate fin type of heat exchanger. Okay, in fact, if you remember last time I was mentioning that uh, Case and London uh, have given uh, several correlations for different types of uh, condensers, so we'll be using the general correlation suggested by Case and London. Okay. Uh, in fact, if you remember uh, the case and London correlation is uh, uh, the Reynolds number is defined in terms of the maximum uh, velocity and maximum velocity takes place where the flow area is minimum. Okay? So maximum velocity is nothing but the face area, you, you can show that it is nothing but the face area divided by, uh, I am sorry, face velocity divided by minimum flow area. Uh, this comes from your uh, continuity equation. Okay? Uh, how, how did you get this? Let us say that you have two tubes here. Okay, and this is the minimum flow area AC. Okay, and at this point, uh, uh, the velocity is U max, right? And let us say this is the at the face. At the face, you have the face area, okay, uh, or area between two tubes, and you also know the uh, velocity, face velocity. Okay, and from mass balance, we know that. 
a u is constant okay so u max is you will find that phase velocity divided by a c because we are writing a c in terms of per meter square uh, uh, phase area okay so that is why the phase area term does not come here because we are uh, doing all the calculations per meter square phase area okay. So, you find that uh, using that uh, you find that the uh, maximum velocity is 3.854 meter per second. So, the phase velocity is 2.5 meter per second, but by the time the air comes between the two tubes, it uh, its uh, area of cross section gets reduced. So, its velocity increases to 3.85. Okay. Then we find the Reynolds number, Reynolds number is uh, u max into hydraulic diameter divided by nu. So, whatever we have calculated the hydraulic diameter and all will be used now. Okay. So, we know the hydraulic uh, diameter value, we have computed this, this is the kinematic viscosity and u max is the uh, maximum velocity that is 3.854 meter per second. So, we substitute that you find that Reynolds number is 983.6. Then we use, as I said we use the general uh, correlation suggested by Case and London. Uh, which is given as uh, Nusselt number is H naught dH by K that is equal to 0 0.117 Reynolds number to the power of 0 0.65 Prandtl number to the power of 1 by 3. So, we know Reynolds number, we know Prandtl number, so we can substitute this. So, we find that the Nusselt number is 7.835 and heat transfer coefficient H naught is equal to 51.77 Watt per meter square Kelvin. Now, overall heat transfer coefficient for uh, plate fin type uh, heat exchanger the formula is like this. This formula was mentioned in the last class also. So, here uh, you have the fouling resistance uh, on the uh, refrigerant side, you do not have any fouling resistance on the air side, that means outside fouling resistance is not there. Okay. And uh, uh, you know various uh, this thing A naught by I and uh, these are the area ratios, R I, R I and R naught are the inner and outer radii of the tubes and uh, eta f is the fin efficiency which is known to us, h naught is the external heat transfer coefficient, h i is the internal heat transfer coefficient. Okay. Uh, so, if you have all these things are known to us, we have already computed all these things. So, if you substitute those values, you find that overall heat transfer coefficient is 31.229 watt per meter square Kelvin. Okay. And now, we have to find out the LMTD because we would like to, we have to find out the area. So, for that we have to find the LMTD. Okay. Again, we have to do some trial and error uh, method here because we do not know what is the outlet temperature of air. Neither we know the outlet temperature of air nor we know the mass flow rate of air. Okay. Uh, since we do not know these two parameters, we cannot calculate uh, the LMTD directly. So, what we have to do is uh, we have to assume either mass flow rate or the outlet temperature. So, it is easier to, uh, okay, it's now it is uh, all the same, but let us assume the outlet temperature of air. Okay. Uh, the outlet temperature of the air you have to assume in such a way that it should not be greater than the condensing temperature obviously, because heat transfer has to take place from refrigerant to air. Okay. So, in this problem let us assume a value of 35 degrees for the outlet temperature of air. So, once you assume the outlet temperature of the air, inlet temperature is given as 27 degrees, condensing temperature is given as 40. So, we can calculate what is the LMTD. So, LMTD is 8.3725 degree centigrade. Okay. So, once you know the LMTD, we can find out what is the total uh, external area, okay. uh, a total. How do we know this? Because Q c is nothing but u naught into to total external area multiplied by LMTD. So, LMTD is uh, computed 8.3725 and Q c is 21.17 and u naught is 31.229. Okay, I am multiplying here because this 21.17 is kilowatts. So, I am converting everything into watts because u naught is in watt per meter square Kelvin. So, if you do that, you find that the total external area is 80.976 meter square. Okay. So, this is the total area and uh, remember that this is a, this can have many rows. right? So, total area means uh, total area of the condenser, that means area of all the rows. right? And so far, nothing has been mentioned about the rows. right? And in the last class, I have mentioned that the number of rows can vary anywhere between 2 to 8. Since this is not a very large capacity system, it is a 5 ton capacity system, let us take the number of rows to be 4. Okay. So, I am assuming the number of rows to be 4. Once you assume the number of rows to be 4, uh, total uh, area is nothing but A phase area into number of rows into A naught. 
why is why are we writing like this because a not is nothing but the total area per meter square face area per number of rows okay so that's why you get the this kind of formula and a not is known to us number of rows are assumed to be 4 and uh, a face area is not known to us but a to total is just now we have calculated 80.976 so if you substitute all these values you find that face area is 0.882 meter square but uh, this is this may not be the correct face area you have to check because you have assumed that the outlet temperature to be 35 degrees centigrade okay whether that is right or wrong you have to check now how do we check that we calculate the mass flow rate of air mass flow rate of the air is nothing but if you apply the uh, continuity equation it is nothing but rho into a phase into v where v is the phase velocity that is 2.5 meter per second and a phase is computed to be 0.8824 meter square and rho is the density of air which is 1.1774 kg per meter cube this is the mean density right so if you substitute these values you find that this is the mass flow rate of air right once you know the mass flow rate of air you can easily calculate what is the outlet temperature how can you calculate that we know that for the condenser you can also write qc as mass flow rate of air into cp into delta t so delta t is nothing but qc divided by mass flow rate of air into cp cp i have taken here as 1.005 okay so uh, uh, and the mass flow rate of air we have computed and this is a qc right here you need not uh, multiply into 1000 because this is in kilojoule per kg kelvin so you find that delta t we have obtained we have obtained it to be 8.11 degree centigrade right now what is the delta t is 8.11 degree centigrade means what is the outlet temperature outlet temperature is nothing but t outlet for a of air is t inlet of air plus delta t okay t inlet is given as 27 plus 8.11 this is 35.11 degree centigrade so you find that uh, coincidentally if, uh, the water you have calculated is very close to whatever you have guessed okay so the guess value and calculated values are coming very close okay so if this accuracy is sufficient you can stop uh, the trial and error procedure at this point and you can take this phase area is the uh, required phase area but if you want very uh, high uh, precision then you can go for a second uh, trial by taking the outlet temperature to be let us say 35.1 okay so you can continue this but sometimes uh, if you get uh, accuracies of uh, this kind of accuracy there is no point in really going for more and more number of trials because remember that uh, there is always an, an uh, element of uncertainty in the calculation of heat transfer coefficients okay the, they themselves may give uh, uh, uncertainties could be as high as about plus or minus 25 percent okay so there is no point in really looking for very close uh, accuracies in areas right So that is what I have mentioned here. So t, t a route as calculated is 35.11 degree centigrade. Since the guess value is close to the calculated value, we may stop here. For better accuracy, calculations have to be repeated with second guess value of 34.1 degree centigrade. Okay. And uh, there is one thing you must keep in mind: the values obtained will be slightly different if other correlations are used for HI. As I said, uh, a large number of correlations are available for uh, estimating the heat transfer coefficients. For example, on the condenser side or on the air side. Had you used some other heat transfer correlations, you might have got uh, slightly different results. Okay, that's what I may mean by saying there is a lot of uncertainty, right? Uh, if you want, you can check by using other correlations and see what value you are getting. Okay, uh, so this is the procedure for estimating uh, for design thermal de design of uh, condensers. Okay, you are, you, if you proceed in a systematic manner, uh, the problem is very simple. Okay. So at this point I stop my uh, lecture on condensers and uh, let us go to the next important component that is evaporators. So I will give a brief introduction and uh, classification of evaporators in this lecture. Okay. So as you know evaporator like condenser is also a heat exchanger. In an evaporator the refrigerant boils or evaporates and in, in doing so absorbs heat from the substance being refrigerated. The name evaporator refers to the evaporation process occurring in the heat exchanger. Now let us look at the classification of evaporators. In fact, you can classify uh, evaporators in many ways. Uh, there are several ways of classifying the evaporators depending upon the heat transfer process or depending upon the refrigerant flow type or depending upon the condition of heat transfer surface, etc. Okay. For example, you, um, uh, you can uh, classify them as either force convection type or natural convection type. And as you know in uh, what is a force convection type evaporator in force convection type evaporator just like force convection type condenser 
a fan or pump is used to circulate the external fluid. External fluid could be water or air or, or any other uh, media. Okay, so you need a pump or fan for circulating this external fluid. Okay, uh, and uh, make the make it flow over the heat transfer surface, which is cooled by evaporation of refrigerant. This is the force convection type evaporator. Natural convection type, as you know, in natural convection type, we don't use either a fan or pump. And the flow circulation takes place because of buoyancy effects. The buoyancy effects are induced due to density differences, which are caused by temperature difference. Okay, this is nothing but the natural convection type evaporator, just like natural convection type condenser. Okay, in natural convection type uh, evaporator, refrigerant always boils inside tubes, and evaporator is located at the top. You have to locate the evaporator at the top because you are relying on the natural convection. Natural convection means uh, what happens is when you are keeping at the top. Uh, a warm air comes in contact with the evaporator, it becomes cold, once it becomes cold, its density increases, once its density increases because of the buoyancy effect, it uh, tries to settle down. When it uh, settles down, uh, the warm air from the bottom uh, rises up and warm air goes to the uh, evaporator, it gets cold and again it comes down. So, this cycle is repeated. Okay. So, to continue maintain this cycle, you have to keep the evaporator at a height. The temperature of fluid which is cooled by, by it decreases, I am just explaining what is the mechanism. The temperature of fluid which is cooled by it decreases and, uh, decreases and its uh, density decreases. As a result, uh, the fluid moves downwards due to buoyancy and the warm fluid rises up to replace it. Okay. You can also classify the evaporators based on the refrigerant flow, whether it is taking place inside the tubes or outside tubes. The heat transfer, the, this is very important because the heat transfer phenomena. Okay, just like condensation is entirely different if it uh, if evaporation or boiling is taking place inside the tubes uh, or if it is taking outside the tubes. Okay, the phenomena is different, the correlations will be different and the values of heat transfer coefficients also will be different. So, it is very, very important to keep this in mind and use the suitable correlations. Okay. So, this is another way of uh, classifying. The third way of classifying is uh, by uh, classifying them either as flooded type of evaporators or dry expansion type of evaporators. In flooded type uh, evaporators, liquid refrigerant covers the entire heat transfer surface. Okay, so, this is known as a flooded type evaporator and the refrigerant leaves evaporator as liquid vapor mixer. Okay. And what is a dry expansion type? In a dry expansion type, the refrigerant leaves the evaporator in vapor form and not the entire uh, heat transfer surface, surface area is covered with liquid. Okay, there are some area is covered with the vapor. Okay, so this is known as dry type. Now let let, let me explain the salient features of uh, some of the important types of uh, uh, evaporators. So let me begin with natural convection type of evaporator. Okay, natural convection type of evaporators are uh, mainly used in domestic refrigerators and cold storages. Since flow is buoyancy driven, evaporator has to be kept at the top. You might have, uh, for example, let me uh, everybody must have seen it uh, in old type uh, refrigerators, not frost free type, in conventional type refrigerators, the evaporator is kept at the top. Okay. In fact, uh, this is nothing but uh, uh, evaporator come freezer box. Okay, evaporator and it also acts as a freezer compartment or freezer box. Okay. So, evaporator tubes are uh, kept here, it can be a roll bond type or tube and plate type and uh, you store the food products everywhere, the frozen food is kept here and other food uh, food stuffs are kept, kept here, vegetables, fruits, etcetera. Okay. So, the gravitation is in this direction, this is the top. So, since you are keeping the evaporator at the top, uh, the air close to the evaporator becomes cold and uh, um, since its density increases, the air will come down. Okay. So, if you see from the uh, side, the evaporator will be something like this. Okay. So, cold air comes down right? and as it comes down, it comes in contact with the food products kept at the bottom and uh, it takes the heat from the food products and it becomes warm. Once it becomes warm, again it rises up. Okay. Once it rises up, again it comes in contact with the evaporator surface, it becomes cold and again it comes down. So, this natural circulation is maintained by keeping the evaporator at the top. Okay. Normally, um, these are unfinned when used in cold storages. The, as I said, these are mainly used in domestic refrigerators and cold storages. In domestic refrigerators, uh, uh, fins are added, but in cold storages, fins are not used. Okay. 
a sufficient space should be provided all around the evaporators for air flow. This is very important just like your uh, condensers, uh, flat back condensers or wire and tube uh, type of condensers, you are relying on buoyancy effects for uh, air flow. Okay. So, the delta T's are not uh, normally very high, so the potential for uh, the air flow is uh, generally small. So, if there is large resistance, uh, then the air flow gets affected adversely. Okay. So, if you want to have good air flow, you have to provide sufficient space all around the evaporator, so that air can flow with minimum resistance. Okay. So, that is why you might have seen in the domestic refrigerator that they do not put the evaporator uh, right at the top, that means there will be some space all around the evaporator, so that air can flow all around the evaporator. Okay. And baffles are provided to separate the warm air and cold air plumes. Now, what are the advantages of uh, natural circulation evaporators? Evaporator occupies less force, uh, floor space. This is very important, um, especially in cold storage centers, because floor space, uh, uh, if the system occupies a lot of floor space, then uh, valuable floor space is lost because you could have stored some products in that floor space, and by storing more pro products, you could have earned more money. Okay, so floor space is very valuable. So when you are using a natural convection type of uh, 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 evaporators in cold storages, they are kept at the uh, right near the ceiling, okay. so it does not occupy any floor space. right? So, this is one of the advantages of natural circulation type evaporators. Second advantage is they can operate for longer periods without defrosting and they are simple to make and easy to maintain because uh, especially in cold storages and all, they are plain tubes, Okay, normally they are unfilled, so they are they will be simply welded at the site. So, there are no fins, nothing, just you have to take the pipes and weld the pipes at the site okay. and the maintenance is also easy and very useful when low air velocities and minimum dehumidification of the product is required. Uh, since you are relying on uh, natural convection and uh, the delta T available for uh, natural convection, obviously you won't find any air blast or anything. Okay. So, the air velocity will be very, very small. Once the air velocity is small, there is no danger of uh, products getting uh, dried up too much. Okay. These are one typical problem with uh, uh, force convection type of evaporators because uh, air velocity is high. High air velocity means high heat and mass transfer rate, so drying of uh, products take place, whereas uh, in natural convection type, this problem is not there. Okay. Uh, however, there are certain uh, disadvantages. Uh, the disadvantage obviously is that you require very long lengths because the overall heat transfer coefficient is typically small. This is small because you are relying on natural convection. Hence, uh, higher refrigerant inventory and higher pressure drops. Once the required tube length becomes large, you have to put uh, large amount of refrigerant inside the system. Okay? Once you put large amount of refrigerant inside the system, there are other problems. The cost will be more okay? and if the refrigerant is uh, toxic and flammable, it will uh, have safety problems. Okay. In addition to that, uh, there are other problems like uh, uh, pressure equalization takes a long time and uh, defrosting also takes long time. Okay. So, these are some of the disadvantages of having long lengths. Okay. In addition to this, if you have long uh, refrigerant tubing, pressure drop also will be large. So, if you want to minimize the pressure drop, you may have to go for parallel circuits. Okay. Now, let me quickly explain the second type that is the flooded type evaporators. Uh, they are typically used in large ammonia systems. The refrigerant enters a surge tank through a float type expansion valve. The compressor directly draws the flash, flash vapor which improves the performance. As you know that once your flash vapor is not allowed to go to the evaporator, performance improves. We have seen this in multi-stage systems. And the liquid refrigerant enters the evaporator from the bottom of the surge tank. The mixture of liquid and vapor flows along the evaporator tubes. The vapor is separated as it enters the surge drum or surge tank. Okay, unevaporated liquid is recirculated. So let me quickly explain this. So this is the flooded type of evaporator. Okay, so this is the evaporator portion, right? Let us uh, for, for the timing. Let's assume that this is used for let us say cooling uh, uh, air. Let us say so you have a fan and fins and all. Air is blowing over this. So we have a uh, the component surge tank here. And refrigerant from the condenser enters the surge tank through the float valve. This float valve acts as an expansion device here. Okay, this is expansion device used here. And what is the purpose of this float uh, type of valve? It always maintains the required level uh, of refrigerant in the surge tank. Okay, if the, when the level falls, uh, the valve will open more. More refrigerant will come here. So normally, this is connected to a condenser or receiver condenser. Okay. And uh, you can see that uh, when the refrigerant enters at this point, uh, it is vapor plus liquid. 
because due to flashing across the expansion device some vapor would have uh, been generated. So, you have both vapor and liquid, but what you are doing is by separating vapor and liquid in the surge tank you are allowing only liquid to go to the evaporator and vapor instead of going to the evaporator it directly goes to the compressor. Okay. So, that is how you can improve the efficiency of the evaporator. So, as uh, you can see the from the picture that only liquid refrigerant goes through the evaporator and as the it uh, flows through the evaporator it takes heat from the surroundings and vapor is generated. Okay. So, you can see the vapor bubbles. So, you find that at the outlet of the evaporator again you have a vapor liquid mixer. This is the feature of a flooded type of evaporator, not all that refrigerant that goes to the evaporator will evaporate. Okay. There will be a large amount which is unevaporated, the unevaporated amount will simply recirculate. So, whatever vapor is there again that vapor plus water vapor is generated here both will be compressed by the compressor. Okay, so, this is the flooded type evaporator. You can see that there is a lot of liquid in the evaporator and the evaporator surfaces are always wet that will give you higher heat transfer coefficient on the refrigeration side. So, this is the advantage of flooded type of evaporator. Okay. And mass flow rate through evaporator is not same as the mass flow rate through compressor and the ratio of these two mass flow rates is called as recirculation factor F. And if you apply the mass balance for steady state, whatever mass is leaving uh, the surge tank must uh, enter the surge tank. Okay. Uh, then the, uh, that means what you have to do, you have to apply a mass balance across the uh, surge tank. Okay. From that you can easily show that the recirculation factor F is 1 minus x4 divided by x. What are x4 and x? x4 is the quality of refrigerant at the inlet to the surge tank and x is the quality of the refrigerant at the outlet of the evaporator. Okay. So, this is uh, by applying the mass balance across the surge tank. Okay. So, once you know the qualities you can calculate what is the circulation factor. Circulation factor will be uh, greater than 1 that means more uh, refrigerant circulates through the evaporator than is evaporated. Okay. Now, since liquid, uh, what are the advantages? Since liquid refrigerant is in contact with whole of evaporator surface, the refrigerant side heat transfer coefficient will be very high. Sometimes a liquid refrigerant pump may also be used to further increase the heat transfer coefficient. The lubricating oil tends to accumulate in the flooded evaporator, hence an effective oil separator must be used immediately after the compressor. Okay. Right, I will stop the lecture here and I will continue this uh, lecture uh, in the next uh, class. Okay. In the next class, I will give you a uh, formula for calculating the heat transfer coefficients and area of uh, evaporators. Okay. Thank you.